But what came out was Veronica's ag now. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we are talking all things Heather's the Musical. So I put out a little feeler on my Instagram story and asked people what kind of things they want to see and the overwhelming majority was Heather's. So I've got some questions from you guys and I'm going to talk about my general time in Heather's but first let's start at the beginning. So I first saw Heather's in 2018 at the Haymarket Theatre. So it had done its other palace run, sold out, and now it's transferred to the West End. And I just moved to London and me and my friend Matty were gonna go and see a show and we didn't really have any in mind, but we wanted to see like one of the big ones. So I think we went to Les Mis and then we went to Phantom and they were ridiculously expensive and we were obviously students. So we went across the road from Phantom to the Haymarket and went to the box office and asked if they had any tickets left. And they had two and they were right at the very back of the balcony. Anyone that's been to the Haymarket will know that it's as steep as anything. And we were on the very back row of the theatre, four tiers up. And we paid 25 quid, so it was fine, cheap tickets. And we thought, let's see what this is all about. Like we'd heard of it, but none of us really knew it. And little did we know that it was gala night. Like we saw all of the cameras out front, but we kind of, I didn't know if that was just a usual thing at, at theatres. Like I'd literally been to the West End once when I was about 10. So we watched the show and I just remember Jamie Moscato finishing Freeze Your Brain and thinking, yeah, that's a bit me, like, I wanna do that. But there's something about Jamie where he made it sound so much harder than it is for him. It's very easy for him. And I actually know that from speaking to him when he came and watched me and Heather's eventually, which is mind blowing. I said to him like, well, what was the part that you found the hardest? And with no kind of vanity, he was like, because he kind of paused a bit and was like, and I thought he's going to say it and he's going to say it and he went, kind of none of it really. <laughs> and I just performed to him and was literally struggling for the whole show. And I just remember being like, wow, you're insane. But I thought I could never do that role because like you say, it was too high and just too hard and too shouty and too, just I could never do that. So I thought, Cut to 2021 and Heather's is coming back to the Haymarket and I happen to have Paul Taylor Mills on Instagram and I thought I'm just going to shoot my shot. So I messaged Paul and said, hi Paul, I heard it's coming back to the Haymarket, can I get an audition? So I recorded that, sent it over and I didn't hear anything for about a week and I thought, that's fine, they don't want me, they want someone that actually knows what they're doing, that's got like experience. This was the first thing I'd ever auditioned for, would have ever been in. But then a week later, Paul messages me and says, can you do the sides? The scenes and I was like uh, okay like I'm, I'm taking that as like a recall so I sent him me doing the pre-17 scene which is like you know, JD saying oh my mum died my dad's not nice and didn't hear anything for about a week again and I was like absolutely fine I'm pushing my luck thanks for even like watching them then a week later again he messages and says, who's your agent? And I was like, right, this is getting serious now. Like, what is going on? I didn't have an agent. And looking back on it now, I don't know if I knew this in the moment, but it almost definitely was going to be an offer. By the way, this is for cover. This is for cover JD, the geek track. I knew that from the offset. Like, I knew they'd cast JD. But before I even had time to think about that, or, you know, before Paul even, before I gave him any email or anything, which I didn't have, I didn't have an agent. I just remember being in the gym, which is bizarre because I do not go to the gym, but I was going through like this gym phase of my life. And I literally used to go about five times a week. Anyway, it, I hate it. But I remember being in the gym, drafting this message, well, I clearly wasn't doing much if I was drafting a message, drafting this message to Paul and being like, oh, maybe I'm never gonna work again. Like, I bet he's gonna say, how dare you mess me around. <laughs> he's not like that at all, but in my head, all these things were going around and I thought, oh gosh, I messed it up. But basically I couldn't do it because my September, which is the, the bulk of when the show was, was jam-packed with stuff with since September. And I'd already committed to that. I couldn't not do that. So I had to kind of tell Paul that after I've thought about it, it's just not gonna be possible. And it was heartbreaking, but I had to do it. And then I just got over it and thought, right, that just wasn't meant to be that time. But I always had an inkling of something's gonna happen for me with Heathers. I don't know why, it wasn't like a manifesting thing. 
it just felt right that something to do with Heathers was gonna pop up in my life. I didn't know what it was, it could have been anything. Maybe I was gonna work for a house, who knows. So that part of my Heathers journey is over. But then two months later, Heathers has announced that it's coming back to the other palace. So I messaged my agent and said, what's going on with Heathers? Do you think I can get in for it? And she said, I'll message Paul. But Paul gets back and says, sorry, we've got a full cast. It's just, it was cast very quickly, um, very last minute. And I just thought that's absolutely fine. Today's their first day of rehearsals. Of course, I'm not going to be casting it. Genuinely, about two hours later, I get a message from Paul saying, hey, babe. He loves to say babe. Hey, babe, how are you doing? As if I was going to reply like, yeah, good, thanks. Just chilling, playing FIFA. Hey, babe, how are you doing? What are you doing for the next 13 weeks? And I just knew that that was about Heather's. Like, we'd had the conversation a couple of months ago about it. He'd already seen me do Freeze Your Brain, seen me do the scenes. They clearly needed someone now. I've never found out why on the Sunday they had a full cast and on the Monday they didn't. I will never know. But by the end of that Monday, after I'd sent a few things off to America and stuff, I was in Heather's at the other palace playing Billy Good Geek, covering JD. But the whole process was just unbelievable. I will never forget sitting in the other palace studio that first day, Phil Cornwall, RMD, who's incredible playing that bum, 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 bum. at the beginning of Beautiful. Elsa saying, September 1st, 1989, dude, diary for the first time, for the first time, I stayed in the American accent then. Even thinking back to it now, I've got the recordings of the voice memos, and sometimes I stumble across them whilst I'm looking for something else, and I just listen to that first beautiful harmony that I ever had to learn, and it just makes me like, it just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy. And it was November, and it was coming on Christmas, and it was just, oh, good vibes all around. And to be honest, that was a very good indicator for the whole run. Like, obviously it was a very eventful run for me, but generally, it was just one big dream. I obviously started as the geek and ended up my time at Heather's as JD. Speaking of which, my first show was one of the best days of my life. I'll always remember it was the 1st of December. We'd done six shows and this was the first show after previews. We'd done the press night on the Tuesday night. This was Wednesday matinee and there was a show stop. The person playing JD had to go off because they were ill and all of a sudden it was like, all eyes on me, can you go on as JD, halfway through a show. And I, I had to just say like, I, I actually can't, like, I know it's my job to, but I've had two weeks rehearsal for the whole show, which was obviously me just focusing on getting my dancing right. And I knew the lines for JD, but there's no way I could have just gone on act two and performed as JD. I could have done the songs, I could have done the lines, but I would have been genuinely a safety hazard for anyone on that stage, especially Elsa, because I was just, I didn't know where to go. I'd never, I'd never done a, I'd never done a rehearsal as JD. So they canceled that show and I ended up going on that evening, Wednesday evening, the 1st of December. And we went up half an hour late just to give me that little bit of extra time. And oh, it was just the best. Now I look back, I was very, very nervous. And I don't think I really relished that show because I was just focused on getting my words out. I don't think I acted it very well. I don't think I sang it very well. I was just making sure that the words came out of me, that I didn't get in anyone's way and hurt anyone, and that the show carried on as usual. I wasn't really focused on my performance. But then at the same time, I knew that I might not go on again. Nine more. did end up going on for about two weeks in a row, so I really got to grow into the character. And then by the end of the run, I don't know the exact figures, but I think I played JD about 50 times as a cover. So I'd really got my chance to kind of 
prove I could do it, prove to myself I could do it, because I think that's the biggest thing as a performer is, I remember that day that I got the offer for Cover JD, and I said to my agent like, oh, I'm kind of thankful that I got Cover JD because if I'd have just got JD and had to start tomorrow, I don't think I could do it. Like, I'd get two in my head and think, it's too high, I can't do it. I remember saying like, oh God, thank God I've got a bit of time to ease into it. Little did I know, I really didn't. It's almost a good thing that I just got thrown on because I didn't have time to doubt myself. I just had to do it and I had a job to do. Literally, I had a job to do, but also for the sake of everyone else in that building, I had a job to do. I had to cover the role that I am paid to cover. And then I was very lucky to take over for five weeks as Principal JD, you could call it, JD. And the rest is history, as they say. Now, I put out something on my Instagram asking people to ask questions about my time in Heathers, and I've got a few here. So the first question from Stitch and Spin is, what was your funniest onstage moment? And it's got to be when Tom Scanlon effectively had a mini stroke on stage. It was the scene where JD standing at the front, and I was on as JD, and I, I was stood at the front with the book, and the two jocks, Kurt and Ram, are on the steps behind, and they say something like, oh, who's that guy I think he is anyway, Bo Diddley? And Tom, who played Ram, is meant to say, Veronica's into his act, no doubt. But what came out was, Veronica's ag doubt. <laughs> and I'm not even doing it justice. It was honestly, you couldn't have written it. I think it was actually just a different language, but that wasn't necessarily the funny bit. The funny bit was, obviously as actors, we're not allowed to laugh on stage and you're not meant to laugh on stage, but in any part of life, if you're told you can't do something, you naturally just want to do it. We can't get away from it as humans. They start to laugh, you know, but they kind of can because their characters are a bit dumb and a bit stupid and they were kind of like giggling at each other and just, you know, laughing at each other. But they then walk up to me and they're both kind of doing their giggly like character. They're laughing, but they're getting away with it because it's their character. So they walk down and I've got Ram here, Kurt here, and they're both laughing, saying their lines, and I just, my shoulders just start going and I'm reading this book. And I, I'm not like laughing out loud, but I can't contain it. Andy Fickman, if you're watching, I'm sorry. It happened. I couldn't do anything about it. And we then had to do this fight scene where it's slow motion and I go to punch Tom and we stop and then Elsa sings uh, Fight For Me. And it's a freeze frame for about a minute and we're both looking into each other's eyes going, I wish I could say the audience didn't notice, but they did notice because you could hear them laughing. <laughs> and it was it was one of the worst corpses I've ever done in my life. And that was definitely, that was the funniest onstage mishap. The next question is from LEB05. And she says, what was your favorite song to perform? And I get asked this question quite a lot and it's gotta be meant to be yours. The thrill that you get from singing that song it's like nothing else, genuinely, it's like nothing else I've ever experienced before. As soon as I step foot off that stage, once I do the, um... Still I will if I must. Still I will if I must. Veronica! And Veronica's mum and dad walk in. I climb back through the window and I'd, every single night, I'd run off. I'd have the scrunched up piece of paper in my hand, the petition. And I'd literally run up to the nearest bin, throw it in. I felt invincible at that point in the show. And I'd have the same ritual. I'd throw that in the bin, I'd run off, grab a sip of water and go around and collect the bomb. It was honestly the most insane feeling in the world. I do sometimes think, will I ever get a thrill like that ever again from a show? That song and that role was, oh, oh, I loved it. Ocean of Debris asks, what was going through your mind when you spotted the bootleggers? I was probably in the minority of people that I never really cared when I spotted bootleggers. First of all, I was absolutely the worst at spotting them. Sometimes it was obvious and there were literally people on the front row like, you know, sometimes people would put their cameras in their top pocket. There'd be like phones like that and the camera would just be pointing out and it was quite clearly on. But a lot of the time, if it was anywhere past the front two rows, I would just not have a clue, which is weird because I spent a lot of the time looking out into the audience. Not necessarily on purpose, but JD's quite a ponderer, or at least my version of JD was quite a ponderer. So like, you know, a lot of it, he was always thinking, he was always planning his next like move or whatever. And I just generally spend a lot of time looking out, but I was awful at spotting if anyone was holding a phone. But if I ever saw anyone film the show, I'd choose to turn, turn the other way. 
and pretend I never saw it. I'm not necessarily encouraging bootlegging. You didn't hear it from me, I'm not. But it is nice, it is nice, and any actor is lying to be able to have that footage at a later date. So yeah, I never used to care if they were bootleggers, but to be fair, I didn't really notice many people. But one thing I absolutely couldn't stand, and this was like a, you know, people knew this about me, was bad theatre etiquette. Oh, and I would absolutely use like JD's character to tell people not to do things. I wouldn't literally go like, but I'd give them the menacing like, do you know what I mean? I'd go a bit crazy on them. And if they were in the front three rows and it got to meant to be yours and they were still being a nuisance, I would scream that song at them. And sometimes they think I was egging them on. Like there was this group of men once that were like talking through the whole show and it was actually giving me like anxiety because you think, what if they're talking about me? Or what if they don't like, you know, sometimes they're laughing and you think, are oh, they laughing at me? But it got to meant to be yours and I screamed the chorus at them and they were like, Oh, he's singing it to us. He's singing it to us. And I was like, no. I <laughs> then I did go to the company manager and was like, they need to, they need to actually either shut up or get kicked out. And because it was so near the end of the show by that point, they ended up staying. But I went up to them after the show and said, I hope you realise you ruined that for a lot of the audience that was sat around you and for the entire cast. And they were just as rude from the house as well. So you can't change some people. AAAMY underscore X asks, what song do you think isn't talked about enough? And I've always said, Our Love Is God is an underrated song. I think because there's little bits of dialogue and scene in between the song, it gets cut up and people don't see it as like, you know, it's not a standalone three and a half minute song like Freeze Your Brain is. It is like a, it's a song that progresses the story. But because of that, it gets lost and it becomes a bit more like recitative almost than a song. But the melodies of I Love Is God and the harmonies and the way it starts of like JD and Veronica on the floor, like he's basically crying, she's crying. And it ends with him holding a gun basically in front of her, his arms wrapped around her, looking like an absolute killer. I, I just think the song is stunning and it's definitely the most overlooked song in the show. Shar JX asks, favorite between show food and snacks. I don't know if you've ever been to Victoria, but there is a Wagamama's right next to Heather's. And my absolute go-to whilst I was at Heather's was Wagamama's. There was one right near the other palace in Victoria. And in the interval, I used to pre-order whatever I wanted. It was usually the chicken rice curry or the katsu curry. And I used to pre-order it for about, I think it was like 5.40 in between shows, whenever we had a two show day. And then after the show, I'd go and pick it up straight away and have it ready. It was perfect. That's my favorite in between show food. But the things that got me through the actual show were water. I'm not a big water drinker and I should be, it's bad, but I'm not. But I drank like four liters a day, which to, to most people probably isn't that much, but it is a lot for me. Jakeman's were the other thing that literally got me through the show. Especially halfway through the show, I was feeling a bit kind of rough. I'd know just before if like I was going to struggle with meant to be yours or not and during Can Got A Boyfriend I'd just really quickly suck on a Jakeman and then spit it out and run and do meant to be yours and it just kind of opened me up a bit. I don't really know what the purpose of Jakeman's is. I think they're for like sore throats and like chesty coughs but even if I had none of those it would kind of just clear me out a little bit and then every single show without fail I used to have a Manuka honey lozenge and they were quite expensive. They were like nine pounds for a pack of eight, but that was perfect because there were eight shows in a week, obviously. And to me, I just felt like it lined my throat a bit and made it a bit, I don't know, it didn't, sometimes I feel like, especially if I've drank a lot of water, which I was doing on the show, I feel like it can really strip my throat down and make it quite like, I, I feel like it's fragile, but when I say that to people, they say like, oh, that's not right. Like that should be, what should be good for you? And I'm sure it is but it makes me feel really sort of cleansed and too, too sore almost. So I'd have a honey lozenge to kind of like coat my throat. And on the theme of coating your throat, I used to have a thing called throat coat, which was like a tea and it was aniseed flavored. I think that might be wrong, 
but sometimes I'd have that. But the bad thing about that is I'd drink it so fast and it would make me need to wee. So I'd have it before the show and then freeze your brain would be fine because I've just finished drinking it. But dead girl walking when I kind of stay on for about 10 minutes for the me inside of me and dead girl walking and all of that, I would be desperate for a wee. So I kind of stopped drinking that. Bailey Joe XX asks, how did you get told that you'd be playing JD full time? I don't think there is a moment because I ended up playing JD for about five, six weeks before I started doing it full time as a cover, non-stop. I think it was kind of just, it merged into, oh, and when the extension happens, you're gonna play it for five more weeks. There was never like a, oh, here we go, we're offering you JD. It Because of how it came about, it was quite a fluid process. And don't get me wrong, there were a lot of ups and downs in terms of, oh, I am gonna get it, or I'm not gonna get it, or we do need you, we don't need you, can you do it, can you not do it? Because I had the little mix store to go on to, so I knew I couldn't do the full extension, and therefore I thought, well, they probably don't want me because I can only do half of the extension, so they may as well just get someone else in. But for many reasons, they ended up wanting me for five weeks, so I did about 50 shows as JD cover, and then I did five weeks as JD. Joe Doyle 47 asks, how long were you off stage for during the show? I always said that JD's track was pretty perfect because you had the first 10 minutes of the show off, you get to listen to Beautiful, it's nice. You get to kind of be in the dress, you're the only person not on stage by the time the Heathers have gone on. And you get to just kind of chill out in the dressing room. Cause at the other palace, all the boys and all the girls try a dressing room apart from Veronica. And because, because of the lack of space. So, everyone would be on stage, I'd get to turn the intercom down and just kind of like get ready for the show in my own time. Then I'd go on and do Fight For Me and then come off for a bit, but then do Freeze Your Brain. And then once Freeze Your Brain's happened, everyone goes back on for big fun. So I've got another like five minutes where I'm backstage by myself. Then you go on and do Dego Walk in the Me Inside Of Me. Then I'd come off again. And there was just a lot of moments where I was off for five minutes, but then I got to go on for 10, off for five, on for 10, and there was a lot of kind of back and forth, which is nice to be able to come off, reset yourself. And it's especially good for things like, you know, if something's happened during the show and something needs to be fixed, you can come off and say, oh, I can't do that anymore. Or, oh, you know, especially if you, you might need to go off. I never had to go off mid-show, but you know, it is the perfect track to try and work out whether you're gonna be able to carry on doing the show or not, for example, or if, you know, something's on stage and you can't do something because of that. There's a lot of those kind of things. For example, once in Chandler's Nightmare, I came up from the bed when Veronica screams and my mic got caught in the futon and it just ripped off my head, but stayed on the very front. And I was literally like this and I couldn't do anything about it because it was stuck to my head. And Elsa had to walk around and untie me whilst we were doing the scene. It was so, so awful. And I actually don't even think I laughed. I think I was so mortified that I just spoke through it. And then when I came off, I didn't have time to get all my jacket on and stuff, but they're the perfect kind of examples where you can say like, quick, I need more tape or I need this, or I need to do this or I need to do this. Whereas Veronica, for example, I used to sometimes have to go off stage and get tape for Veronica and come back on because I could afford to do that because I wasn't speaking or whatever. Whereas Elsa or whoever's playing Veronica had to just stay on stage and was on for the whole show apart from kindergarten boyfriend basic theater girls asks did it ever feel different performing with an understudy and i suppose i'm in a bizarre scenario here where because i was an understudy for so long even by the time i took over i still kind of felt like an understudy so i never really thought anything of understudies going on because i always felt like i was the one that was not on as my normal track but also on top of that, because I went on quite a lot as JD in the first leg of the run, I ended up being on as JD every time another person made their debut. So for example, when Ivan went on as Ram for the first time, or when MJ went on as Martha, or when MJ went on as Miss Fleming, or when Hannah went on as Mac or Chandler, I was on as JD all those times. So as an understudy myself, I was able to adapt to all of their different versions of the show because I was only just kind of getting to grips with the character myself. It's not like I'd done JD for a hundred shows and then all of a sudden my track was changing because someone else was coming on. But on top of all of that as well, JD doesn't really interact with anyone apart from Veronica. 
there's like one scene he has with Chandler and one scene he has with Duke. Unless the Veronica changed, which it only did a few times, it was pretty much the same show for me no matter who was on. The next question is, did you cry during your final show? <laughs> it's safe to say I did, I did shed a tear. I did shed a tear. Insert clip here. I remember being so sad on that day because I knew I was probably never gonna perform that again. But at the same time, I remember Lizzie B, the wise old owl, Lizzie B. Oh, I love her. She said, just think about it. At least you're ending the show on a high. It's not like I'd done the show for three years and I'd got bored of it and I was ready to go. I wasn't really ready to go, but because I was doing the Look Mix tour, it would have clashed, so I had to go. I think it's because of that that I have such fond memories of the show and I'm so, ready to go back so really it was they were happy tears they were sad tears because i was leaving but they were happy tears because i'd had the best time of my life and you know my family were there my girlfriend was there my girlfriend's family were there and that whole cast was just so supportive and you know it was things like seeing other people cry for me leaving like oh i just loved that cast and i loved that show and I still do love that show, and I still do love that cast. And last, but absolutely not least, because it was the most asked question, is would you ever go back to the show? I think it's safe to say I would happily go back to that show. I finished on exactly 99 JD shows. I did it 99 times. And I've said to Paul, you can't let me finish there. You can't, you can't leave me on 99 and not get that 100. I'm crossing my fingers that one day I do get to go back and I maybe even get to work with Andy, but as JD and work with Larry and Kevin and, you know, get to have a proper rehearsal time but as JD. You never know with Heathers. It could happen, it could not. But either way, I had the most incredible time in it the first time round. And here's to the second. Thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know in the comments what other kind of videos you want to see. I'm thinking of doing something like this, but all about Little Mix The Search. So let me know if you want to see that. And also follow me on Instagram, at the Jacob Fowler, which is where I'll ask people what they want to know. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please like, please subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, see ya.